And if you go a little down the shoreline, you'll notice that white sculptural bust now in Jersey City that depicts a young woman putting her finger to her lips, probably asking us to be quiet and contemplate the waterways of New York and New Jersey. This sculptural bust is by a Barcelona, Spain artist, Jaume Plensa, and it's called Water's Soul, and it was just dedicated last year. And if you look inland on the Manhattan side, you can see just ahead of us in a few blocks inland, a very tall glass-clad tower that everyone refers to as the Jenga Tower or Jenga Block Tower, because especially towards the upper floors, you'll notice those floors that cantilever or project out in different ways. It looks like a kid has stacked those Jenga plane blocks in an odd, unexpected manner. That is a, that's 56 Leonard Street, a, a designed by a Swiss architectural firm, Elsa and de Mahon. Much closer to us, on the left at the end of this slender Pier 36, you'll notice a tan or light brown brick structure capped in dark brown. That is one of four ventilation towers for the Holland Tunnel. The Holland Tunnel was the first automobile connection between Manhattan and New Jersey when it opened in 1927. We're over the Holland Tunnel now. And those ventilation towers incorporate huge fans that pull the carbon monoxide out from below, improving the air source. If you look at the ventilation tower along the shoreline of Manhattan, you'll notice immediately in front of it a structure half this size. It's a light concrete sculptural light work, faceted or multi-sided. That is a new storage facility Welcome to Classic Harbor Line Cruises. I'm speaking a little bit over the tour guide right now just to introduce you. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist, and today we're going to show you the, how the waterfront is going to adapt with the rising tides and climate change. This is the 10 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, and right now the guide that is telling us all everything about this wonderful um, new projects that are going to happen around the waterfront is Doug Fox, part of the American Institute of Architects, specifically in New York. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist, let me know where you're watching from, and I'm going to show you the views as we listen to the guide as well. Enjoy. thousand buildings in the world that have that LEED certification. And if you look along the shoreline of Battery Park City, we're directly across from two orange brick buildings. The one on the right has purple photovoltaic panels on the rooftop. That is the Solaire, one of the first multi-family residential buildings in New York City to get LEED certification. Those photovoltaic panels capture sunlight converted into electricity, reducing the carbon footprint, reducing the use of fossil fuels in this building. They also have stormwater capture. They reduce how much garbage they um, send out to the New York City Gar uh, Sanitation Department. And they take a number of steps to, in some cases, reuse water. They can repurpose gray water and filter it from sinks, for example, and then use it for irrigation purposes. 
a way of saying that a green building takes a number of a broad range of steps to get the green certification program. And if we look inland and up, that tallest tower is One World Trade Center, the glass-clad tower, obelisk in shape. That is part of the redevelopment of the World Trade Center site after the terrorist attack of 9-11. And the now three glass-clad office buildings at the New World Trade Center wrap around the footprints of the original Twin Towers that are preserved at the heart of the 9-11 Memorial that honor the almost 3,000 people who died on 9-11. And it's in that cavernous bathtub that reinforced concrete structure the original World Trade Center where they built out the 9-11 Museum just like the Whitney was flooded. And since then, the World Trade Center site has put in a multi-tiered system of flood protection so that hopefully the next time we have a flood here in Lower Manhattan, the entire World Trade Center site will be protected. We will see what happens. And now Courtney is going to share with us information about a upcoming, in the next couple weeks or so, resiliency project for Battery Park City at their southern end. All right. So Large group? Oh, you're a software architect. Yeah. Oh, there's different groups here. Oh, okay, fantastic. So we got to talk about building information systems. I'll see if I can pull that off. Um, that I'll, be, I'll let you know in two seconds.
so I think that there's a, an element of psychology in this, in, in the sense that we have to come up with really good solutions, but also recognize and be sensitive to the fact that there's we're looking at loss, and we're looking at the loss of the way things used to be. And so um, there are lots of ways to talk about that and address that, but that's just a, a really important message. Thanks, Courtney. We are now in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. On our immediate right-hand side is Ellis Island. Ellis Island was a major immigration depot. 12 million immigrants were processed here between the early 1890s and 1954 when the facility was closed down. The largest structure on the island on the right side, this north end, is made of red brick with the light limestone trim, featuring those four fanciful towers capped with the green onion domes and spires. As part of the centennial restoration of the Statue of Liberty, just ahead of us, and we'll turn to her soon, they had a similar historic restoration here. And in 1990, the Grant Museum that shares the experience of the immigrants arriving here mostly from Europe. And to the left side of the island, where you see that collection of recently refurbished smaller buildings, building the immigrant hospital and detention cells. Many of these smaller buildings have been refurbished and they're slowly opening up as part of the expanded historic interpretation systems. And you'll notice if we look at that stone seawall wrapping around Ellis Island, that that would be no match whatsoever for a storm surge. So when Superstorm Sandy struck, it completely inundated the island as well as the base of the Statue of Liberty just ahead of us. Ellis Island had many of its building systems, plumbing, electrical, mechanical, in the basement. They were destroyed by the salt water, something that was repeated throughout New York City a decade ago. It took a year for them to make improvements and reopen the statue, uh, reopen Ellis Island. The Statue of Liberty was closed for eight months. And so they've refurbished the seawall. They're expecting to be inundated, but they have now moved the building systems at Ellis Island to a higher level so they will not be destroyed the next time. And immediately ahead of us on our right is the famous Statue of Liberty, one of the most famous sites in the United States, a gift from the French to the Americans dedicated in 1886. As we look at Lady Liberty and then look to the right side of the island, you can see an American flag billowing in the wind. Immediately to the right of that flag, you'll notice a new structure. It has a green grass rooftop that slopes down to ground level. That is the new Museum for the Statue of Liberty designed by the architectural firm FX Collaborative. Now all visitors to Liberty Island can access a in-depth history of the Statue of Liberty. It used to be that you had to visit the stone pedestal on which Lady Liberty rests to access that same exhibit. It was the French sculptor Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi who came to the New York Harbor very close to where we are right now, scouting out a location for his planned monumental work. When he was at Bedloe Island today, Liberty Island, he would have seen a fort at the base as we do. That 11-pointed that star shape is Fort Wood, built for the War of 1812. The U.S. government gave Bartholdi the go-ahead. He returned to Paris and started the design process. 
Lady Liberty is made of 300 sheets of copper, each the thickness of two US copper pennies, incredibly thin. She definitely had the brown copper color early on, but through the process of oxidation, as the copper was exposed to the air, the copper sheets transitioned to the green patina that we have today. They then turned to Gustav Eiffel, the famous bridge engineer responsible for the Eiffel Tower in Paris. He designed an internal vertical truss tower that serves as the framework holding each of those copper sheets in place. So if you've ever had crown tickets, the crown are the 25 cutouts that wrap around her forehead, you would have walked up a narrow spiral staircase up to that crown, and when you were inside staircase you would have been inside that vertical truss tower by Gustav Eiffel. And in her extended right arm, she's holding a gilded torch, bringing illumination to the peoples of the world. And at her base, she's actually walking very slowly forward, and she's breaking free from chains and shackles. The statue was a gift from the French to the Americans. In part, they were celebrating the end of slavery here in the United States in the mid-1860s at the end of the American Civil War. And as Captain Justin brings us about, we have a wonderful view of the port, including container ports and passenger cruise ships and the Verrazano Suspension Bridge. And we are going to delve a bit into the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers' plans for helping to protect New York and New Jersey from super storms and hurricanes that are likely to strike increasingly in the future. Do you want to talk? That's right. So I really want to slam that like more more button right more. now. I just mentioned you would talk about if you're enjoying this live video on YouTube and on right. Facebook, share this live so video with uh, relevant Facebook groups about architecture, that. about sustainability, so about New York City, about Staten Island, you see over here. And I hope you're enjoying the tour. This is brought to you by Classic Harbor Lines. Classic Harbor Lines does tours all around New York City. ClassicHarborLines.com. And definitely let me know about when I will be uh, talking about the Empire State. There will be when we go up to East, East River. River. And, yes. uh, and do we go over the top of Manhattan or so we come back here? We're going around uh, the that plan, So the, the um, only way, the only time to see downtown is to see that. Yes. Okay. Actually, uh, there's so much to talk about. Let's see. That, yeah, it will, the sun will be better actually on the East River for you. For the four engineers. Yeah. Okay, after yeah. yeah. almost 10 years came up with an alternative, their final alternative, uh, which does not include that gate at the mouth of the harbor, which I think a lot of the people in the advocacy in the, in the civic community that is working on this issue, uh, we're very pleased to see. And one of the reasons for that is that this is a, a this is a tidal estuary. So the water from the North Atlantic Ocean comes in, high tide, it goes all the way up to a salt line that's near Albany and goes back out. The, it's the Lenape called the Hudson River, the river that flows both ways, and that's because of the tidal influence. That exchange of salt water and fresh water and the movement of the water is extremely important for the aquatic life that lives here and the fisheries and all of what makes this a, a increasingly extremely healthy estuary given our industrial past. So we are instead looking at some solutions. The Corps of Engineers is proposing a mix of walls and gates in smaller places where there are no other options and options where we're going to build wetlands or other types of measures that are green, that are solutions that use nature to prevent water from coming in or reducing the amount of wave action and the strength and the velocity of the water. And so we can, we will be able to see more of those examples, but um, I think that there, I also will say though, that there are a number of solutions that are not considered structural wall type engineering solutions. That includes buyouts. So that includes moving away from the shoreline, moving homes, 
and businesses to higher ground. And um, there's a significant amount of um, complexity in that, as you can imagine. Um, and I was just listening to a podcast this morning about it. Um, and I can talk a lot more about that. I know people are interested. We can get to that later. But um, what's that? Yeah, okay, so, and, and I'll just say a few words about Governor's Island, and I'll hand it back to Doug. So, um, Governor's Island used to be an old Coast Guard base. Um, and, and you'll see, um, when we get around to the other side, you might be able to see some of the historic buildings. There's some beautiful homes where the Coast Guard, Coast Guard leadership lived. And the, the island is owned by the New York State. So right here we're facing Governor's Island and that is the old prison right there and the fortification too. And right here we have Brooklyn, views of the downtown Brooklyn skyline and we're starting to see the Brooklyn Bridge there in the distance. This is a yacht called the Manhattan 102, a 1920s style yacht, 100 foot long right here. And someone asked about food, yeah there's some food. Uh, there's some drinks as well, including some wine. Right now we're enjoying a great tour led by Doug Fox of the American Institute of Architects by Classic Harbor Line. the boroughs of New York City on our right-hand side. You'll notice on our left there's a bright Staten Island ferry that's heading towards us. It's about to make a 25-minute trip across the harbor of the St. George Ferry Tunnel in Staten Island, another borough of New York City. And you'll notice on the immediate other side of the Staten Island Ferry, there are two ferry terminals whose views Let's go this way. We're going to miss for a few moments. Across this small channel, and now we can see the 
the whole alignment of the arch base of this very maritime building that leads to the Earth in the next hundred years. Carousel 
in that transparent enclosure with the accordion light doors. You can imagine this low lying neighborhood was inundated as well. And I'll point out in a moment, after the subway finishes rumbling overhead across the sort of Building 
Yeah. I'll have uh, tea. Yeah, tea? Yeah. Uh, do you have any, any other preferences? Oh, eat, eat. Uh, what do you have for food? We have a shrimp plate, cheese plate, fruit plate, and also hummus plate. And then for the drinks, you want a tea? Uh, tea, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, green tea, black tea? Actually, never mind. Just, just the food plate. Yeah. 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 So they changed the game plan unilaterally. They tore down this southern portion of the park. They ripped up many trees. And what they're doing is essentially elevating the park about eight feet or so. The plan didn't work, but it was done in a unilateral manner as opposed to a more collaborative manner. And Courtney, do you have any, do you have a different alter, uh, view or insights about this? surrounded 
by green space. And throughout New York City, we see huge numbers of these urban renewal programs for middle class and lower income families. They're called super blocks because these large developments often remove the streets and avenues that crisscross these developments. The new owners have put photovoltaic panels on the rooftops of all these buildings that generate about nine and about six percent of the electrical needs of these buildings. And if you look immediately on the shoreline, you can see that woven-like fabric design for essentially concrete flood walls that are being built in front of Peter Cooper Village in Stuyvesant Cove. Another portion of East River Park which is in the process of being rebuilt. So importantly, before I talk about Battery Park City and tiered landscaping that all can cover those concrete flood walls, but in some cases we go ahead and construct these walls. If we look inland on the Manhattan side of the top, we have the perfect view right now inside the cabin of the Indiana limestone with a couple setbacks, plus those vertical Art Deco silvery things projecting out from the top portion of this 1931 office building that was the tallest tower in the world for 40 years until the Twin Towers were completed. When we talk about sustainable design and green buildings today, there might be the recently built buildings that actually can be green and sustainable. But even a building like the Empire State Building can go through a retrofit that can make the building quite green, that can surpass the sustainable features and functionality of some office buildings and residential as well. As part of a state-sponsored initiative, the Empire State Building just underwent retrofits and transformations so that it would be more energy efficient. In some cases, they implement basic features, like they change the windows, and they install triple pin windows. So in the winter, as an example, you're not gonna have a lot of loss of heat. And tools like daylighting. Daylighting is often used in green buildings. It's simply a way to minimize the use of lighting on each floor. You can have many of the desks and offices along the windows, so as much as possible you use natural light instead of electric light bulbs or other forms of light bulbs in order to offer sufficient illumination. And surprisingly, the statue of the Empire State Building, I should say, will be celebrating its 100th anniversary at the beginning of the next decade. So right there we see the Empire State Building, uh, which was being referred to. And if you look inland and up on the Manhattan side once again, you can see one of the most beloved of the Art Deco towers from the 1930s. You'll notice the Chrysler Building it has a series of silvery arches on the top with a sunburst motif embedded into it. Those stainless eyes until you reach the stainless steel spire. If you look at the lowest arch and go down seven floors, you'll notice those gargoyles projecting out. Those are essentially hood ornament designs from Chrysler cars. It was the founder of the Chrysler Automobile Company who had incorporate design motifs from Chrysler cars in many aspects of the exterior design of the Chrysler building. And as the Chrysler building goes in the background out of view, in the foreground, that green-tinted, glass-clad building is the Secretary of Power at the United Nations complex. The UN was created in the aftermath of World War II to try to work toward resolving international disputes through diplomacy instead of war. 
And this UN building is an excellent example of the international modern style, really a celebration of the modern building techniques and materials made of reinforced concrete, steel frame, and since the facade is not playing any role whatsoever in the structural support of the building, you have large plate glass windows offering wonderful views out and beyond. Alpha, yes, every live video is saved, so you can uh, watch it anytime afterwards. And ladies and gentlemen, people of all genders, let me know if you can hear the guide. On these boat tours, it's always a bit tricky to get the best audio, uh, especially if the speakers are literally very high up on the rooftop, on the ceiling of the ship. Uh, so let me know if you're able to hear the guy. I'll do my best to get closer to him, if not. And I uh, hope you're enjoying the views. This is a classic harbor line. They do a lot of tours on these cool, old-style yachts. We this is a 1920s skyline. You can see one of those super tall towers, that white square-shaped tower, with that flat roof, 432 Park Avenue. I will return to the topic of the super talls of being there. Oh, not that one. Sorry, later. he's referring to this one. That iconic white aluminum-clad city court building with a rooftop that slopes down to the left. Earlier on, I talked just briefly about the lead certification and mention also the passive house standard. Passive house is a more recent sustainable certification system. Passive house comes from Germany and is becoming much more successful here. Passive house is performance based. A building has to demonstrate that it's significantly more energy efficient in comparison to comfortable buildings and significantly reduces its use of fossil fuels. So here on our immediate left, we have the new academic campus for Cornell NYC Tech. This is a net zero energy build, energy campus, produced from renewable energy sources, just about all the energy they consume. And this tall residential building right along the shoreline is called the house. It's the house as a residential building for students and faculty, but it's also referencing the passive house standard. So for a building to be a passive house, it usually has an airtight building envelope. So in the winter, more bears not going out, and in the summer, you don't have hot air coming in. And in addition, they implement a number of energy efficient functionalities such as they use heat pumps, which uses electricity, and heat pumps actually work for heating and confusingly air conditioning as well. And I'll talk a lot more about heat pumps when we're on the Hudson, when we're on the Hudson River side. On our right side is now Queens. If you look past the trees, the base of these trees, you can see the now brick bases of residential buildings in the background. Just this Greek glimpse. This is Queens Bridge Houses. Queens Bridge Houses is the largest public housing development in New York City. And I mentioned the Queens Bridge Houses because we're coming up to a power plant on our right hand side, the Ravenswood Power Plant also known as Big Alice, named after the 1960s generators. And not only does public housing in New York City tend to be on the lowest lag areas and former wetlands more susceptible to flooding, they also tend to be near power plants and other manufacturing locations. So the pollution, especially the particulate matter, can be horrendous for people lungs, respiratory ailments that can easily cause. And also, often, if you look at the numbers for visits to emergency rooms in these neighborhoods, you see the largest number of visits, and often for respiratory and related issues. Mm. So in New York City, we have two kind, kinds of power plants. We have what are called baseload power plants and peaker plants. Baseload power plants are always on throughout the year generating a minimum amount of electricity 
the peaker plants are only activated when you have the highest demand. Right now, the highest demand for electricity is usually on the hottest, is during the hottest summer days when you have these 90 plus degree days in the late afternoon, early evening, everyone's cranking up their air conditioners, putting the most demand on the electricity grid, and that is when the peaker plants are activated. And those peaker plants do a considerable amount of contributing to greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases being pumped in the atmosphere, and also that particulate matter that I just mentioned, the pollution that is contributed to these neighborhoods. New York City and New York City has some very ambitious plans. Both the state and the city have passed new climate legislation, both in 2019, and the hope is over the next few years, the decade to come, we will start to dramatically increase the amount of electricity that comes to the city through renewable energy sources, such as through wind turbines and solar or photovoltaic arrays. And we'll also be building more electricity from hydroelectric plants in Canada, and high-speed transmission lines will bring that electricity to the city. So the hope is some of these power plants, especially peaker plants, will close. In some cases, they'll actually transition to battery storage capabilities, meaning as we produce renewable energy, electricity that is then transmitted to New York City, those battery storage arrays will store that electricity until there's a demand for it. One of the challenges is that wind power and solar power are examples of what's called the intermittent sources of energy, meaning that you don't always have sunlight to power the photovoltaic arrays, you don't always have wind to push the turbines. So you generate that electricity when you can and then store it in battery storage arrays that's pulled when there's demand for that electricity. So it's an ambitious plan, and hopefully over the next decade, we will make a lot of progress in that direction. Everything Doug said was exactly right. Just one quick thing about Ravenswood, which is really interesting as well, which is that we are building, in New York State and New Jersey have invested now hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in offshore wind. These offshore wind farms will be built outside the harbor, very hard to see from, impossible to see from New York, a few further south in New Jersey will be visible, the, just the tips from some of the Jersey shoreline. That electricity will have to come into these populated areas. Offshore wind works the best when it's located close to highly dense, high energy demand locations, such as this metropolitan region. The Ravenswood plant may be one of the places where that those huge cables come in and that electricity is then used in different parts of the, of the states, in particular for New York. And so that's another way that that plant over time will become much more sustainable. But it plays a critical role. So I think the, the only thing I'll add to this is just that a lot of the old electric generating facilities will be used over time in the renewable energy world and they will be taking the energy from upstate from hydroelectric and wind and from offshore wind as well and then when we go back down through the port I'll point out a few other locations that are critical to the offshore wind industry which you'd never think of having anything to do with offshore wind mm. <laughs> It's amazing. So here we see Roosevelt Island, the very tip, and now we're seeing the upper side of Manhattan. We're passing by Turtle Bay, uh, Sutton Place, Sutton Place, uh, and then soon we're going to see East Harlem.
everyone right now we have classic harbor line youtube account there tuning in feel free to ask them any questions i will stick around at the by end the of way, the tour and answer any of your questions but i don't want to speak over the guide so enjoy the guide for now so and then i'll answer any questions that recap what he said nice you guys just be cautious, cautious is the right word, it, just be a little quieter, yes, thank you, really appreciate your help on that. The thank Ward's so Island much. Bridge, walking bridge over here connects to Ward's Island, right behind us, and Randall Island, which are connected by landfill. I'm starting to see East Harlem right now, Spanish Harlem, and in Barrio. Franklin Delano Roosevelt Drive, right over here. So yeah, I'll stick around uh, at the end of the tour for 10 minutes or so to answer any questions that people might ask. But right now, Classic Harbor Lines is tuning in, and this uh, broadcast is sponsored by Classic Harbor Lines. So give a round of parts to Classic Har Harbor Line for sponsoring this tour. Uh, check them out, classicharborline.com and on their Instagram as well, and YouTube and TikTok. Jay says, greetings from Greece. Hey Jay, greetings, nice to see you here. Eileen says, wow, excellent harbor. When I get to New York City, you're on the musts. Oh yeah, definitely. I do recommend this. I am loving it. People are asking about the food. Right here. I misunderstood. I thought it was a food plate. Oh, no. right <laughs> it's a fruit Island plate. To <laughs> from us All right, let's see. Island, which is next to Randall's Island, which is coming up in a few moments. So I just pointed out the suspension bridge, part of the Triborough Bridge complex. On your map, it's called the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge, which is the correct name, but nobody calls it that. If you say Triborough Bridge, the Triborough Bridge connects three boroughs 
together in New York City, built by Robert Moses, opening in 1936. We're going to approach soon one of the other bridge spans of the tri that connects to Harlem and 125th Street on the Manhattan side. So Robert Moses is a controversial figure in the history of New York City. Huge numbers of bridges and tunnels, parkways, highways, affordable housing developments, including in East Harlem neighborhood on our left, many playgrounds, parks, and beaches like Jones Beach. He was a brilliant administrator and manager. He would get projects done that had been on the books for decades and nobody else could get done. He was getting financial resources from the federal government, definitely helped during the Great Depression. And then the Roosevelt was president. He was a to the FDR, was the native son of New York State, former governor of New York State. A lot of the New Deal funding came pouring into Moses' projects. But he was also fairly ruthless. If he was building a parkway, nobody really interfered with his game plan. He would tear down the neighborhood, displace many and complete his building project. And a lot of people, especially today, looking back are so critical of Moses because he, everything he invested in was for the benefit of automobiles and highway, sorry, many bridges and tunnels, as I mentioned, and many other roadways, and almost no money for public transportation. That's a fair criticism, but also we have to keep in mind in the mid 20th century, almost any urban planner would have been optimizing automobiles over public transportation. It was the golden age of automobiles. It wasn't until the 1950s when President Eisenhower oversaw the build out of our interstate highway system, so it's a mixed bag. And turning to a much different topic on our right, on Randall's Island, you can see those white tents. New York City just built those tents because the governor of Texas and other states are sending us thousands of immigrants seeking asylum oh, wow. every single week. And these white tents just opened up last week, I believe, they will house 500 men many coming from Venezuela. We are overwhelmed with asylum seekers in New York City, and for that matter, are homeless as well. We have huge challenges on the homeless front. We have huge challenges simply on building enough affordable housing here in New York City. Even though there are many examples, some will point out in a moment, of subsidized housing. So for middle class, lower income families, we're just not close to building a significant enough units to house everyone who needs it right now. And so just ahead of us, another bridge span for the Tribro Bridge Complex. This is a very large-scale vertical lift bridge, part of the bridge structure by Robert Moses. And it's a vertical lift bridge as in the span that we are going to go under to be hoisted upwards for larger boats. I have never seen this lifted up for larger boats. I've seen it hoisted for construction, but large boats don't go up and down the Harlem River that we are on right now. And if you look to your left, and if you look on the shoreline of much of our trip, you will see that the highway, and I should say the shoreline, has been optimized for automobiles for almost 100 years now. And it creates a challenge because we are increasingly using our shoreline to build wonderful parks, but it can be challenging to when you have these roadways interfering with that potential development. So um, it's great that Doug Fox, the guide for the American Institute of Architects here in New York, is mentioning how a lot of the New York City waterfront is designed for cars. It's not designed for humans, uh, for people walking. Uh, that has posed a challenge now. And um, in many other parts of the waterfront, say in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, that is changing quickly. 
and he's referencing very frequently when Moses was. He was the New York City Parks Commissioner and ran a whole host of different agencies and organizations. Master planner of New York City for many decades, only until the mid 60s or so. He had also the close ear of various American presidents. Definitely had a very strong influence over various New York City mayors, starting with Mario Figueroa LaGuardia. And he was also the mastermind of the World's Fair, the ones that happened in 1939 and 1964. But he was also the mastermind of all these highways that crisscrossed through New York City. Unlike in Europe, where highways usually encircle the city, a ring road, here in many parts of the US, including New York, highways pass right through the middle of the city. Ooh, wow, here we see a Keith Haring mural. Look at that. Keith Haring, famous artist. I think it should be a Keith Haring or is Keith Haring inspired, but it looks like an actual Keith Haring. On our right hand side, we now have the Bronx. The Bronx is in another borough of New York City. And we are across from the Mott Haven neighborhood. Surprisingly, this was an old industrial site where we had a huge collection of piano manufacturing sites at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, before radio record players and other systems. People actually bought pianos and sheet music for their parlors. Some of those older buildings converted for residential use and sometimes warehouses. You can see this huge number of new residential buildings being constructed in Mott Haven over the next couple of years. We will have 5,000 residential units coming online here, a mix of market and subsidized housing. And this Mott Haven neighborhood is a good neighborhood to explore the topic of environmental justice and environmental justice neighborhoods. There's huge numbers of instances where we see a lack of equity in terms of how neighborhoods are developed, what, meant, what infrastructure they're near, and the resources that are allocated to these neighborhoods. We've seen some great parks, such as Governor's Island, Battery Park City, on the west side of Manhattan. And you see directly on our right, one of the challenges of building our parks, you have that railroad trestle closest to us making it much more difficult to create green new spaces. And sites like this in the South Bronx are closest to highways, just inland from here. Just out of view is the major Deegan Highway. On the other side, again, another highway system, the Bruckner Expressway, wrapping around this neighborhood. Of course, you have gas burning, diesel burning, trucks and cars contributing to the pollution many manufacturing plants. And in neighborhoods like Mott Haven, you simply have a lot less green covering. I'm going to wait for the metro train crossing over the park. This railroad trestle is the old Point Link railroad trestle that's used often by freight trains carrying garbage out of the South Bronx. So you have a lot less green space, green covering, fewer trees, and if you compare a neighborhood like Mont Haven to Riverdale, further up in the Bronx, it's a suburban-like upscale neighborhood, it's much cooler in the hottest days, for example, there could be a 10 degree differential in the weather, which means that in a neighborhood like this, they're absorbing huge amount of heat with their open spaces, often black tar rooftops, exposed streets and sidewalks without any of that shape at all. And so if you're talking about a lower income neighborhood like we have here, more families don't have air conditioning. So New York City is, has been moving ahead with cooling centers and more location, but it still causes health challenges overall in a neighborhood like this. We add up all those challenges, 
such as limited access to the shoreline for manufacturing plants, more roadways, lower built, and more prone to flooding creates a dramatic number of challenges on the environmental justice front. And fortunately, I'll get to about just two seconds of final thought, is that fortunately, in all levels of the government, federal, state, city, the new climate legislation has, has focused on adjusting these, uh, dealing with these disparities and allocating funds to make up for that difference. Yes? Yes, there are retrofits and other projects underway, including, in some instances, installing photovoltaic panels on the rooftop to provide shade, but also, of course, reduce the carbon footprint of these buildings. We only get a brief glimpse of a building that I want to point out. If you look straight ahead on the right side and up, you can see a tall residential building. You can just make out on its right side. Some floors have those vertical black screens above some of the windows facing to the right. And this is 425 Grand Concourse on the famous Grand Concourse Boulevard in the Bronx. And this is another example of a passive house building with many units for lower income families. Those horizontal screens that go to the right are facing south. That's a great example of what a passive house building is all about. In the winter, the sun is much lower in the horizon and it's to the south, to the right of those window units. So the sun, since it's lower, and the horizon will enter some light and heat will enter those residential units, warming those units in a passive way without using mechanical heating systems. In the summer, the sun is much higher, and as a result, it will bounce off those black horizontal sunscreens and sun heat will not enter those units. An important element of the passive house system. we see another example of a flood wall. This steel bulkhead that has the mesh screen on top of it was built by the Metropolitan Transportation Society Agency, excuse me, Metropolitan Transportation Agency that operates the New York City subways. And this flood was, wall was built because when Super Storm Sandy struck, the storm surge came all the way up here to northern Manhattan inundated the last stop on the number three subway. So by building this flood wall, they're hoping we will not have flooding in the future. The MTA and the sound beat by this bell on were perfect. Oh, Just yeah. Great. It's devastating. Devastating, yeah, with, the, with all the trains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Should I talk about the New York Yankees after their defeat? Four straight and out against the Houston Astros. But in any case, on our right-hand side is the famous home for the Bronx Bombers, the New York Yankees. This is the relatively new Yankee Stadium from 2009. The earlier stadium was just to the right south of 161st Street. That earlier stadium was the 1923 house that Ruth built after Babe Ruth, the home run king. Anybody know the state, the name of the stadium where the Yankees played before they went to the Bronx? And they played on the Manhattan side? Yes, they played at the Polo Grounds that is on the other side of this wonderful McKinley's Dam <laughs> Swing Bridge with a wonderful decorative fields that crowded on the other side. So on our Left-hand side is another example of public housing. 
this is the polo ground houses and the polo ground houses are named after the polo ground stadium, a narrow U-shaped stadium, which football team that had the audacity to leave New York in the late 50s, going out to California, becoming the San Francisco Giants. They kicked out the New York Yankees in the early 20s, and the Yankees went to the Bronx. Sorry, a little bit of a <laughs> adjustment to the gimbal. Wow, gorgeous views. Adam asks, are we in the most northern point of Manhattan? We are, yes we are. We're uh, reaching that point very soon. Wow, look at that. Beautiful views of the leaves changing colors. Here we're saying High Bridge. That's magnificent. We're coming across one of the oldest bridges in New York City, providing water originally to the city of Manhattan, all the way up from the mountains further upstate. And we can see uh, High Bridge Tower right over here, if I'm correct, right in the Washington Heights. Yep, the famous neighborhood for the movie In the Heights. Oh, it's so cool to be up here. This area of Manhattan, people, especially if you're a tourist, tourists rarely go up here, uh, unless if you're taking one of those cruises that go all around Manhattan. So when you're here, know that you're in a very important historical area. Uh, if it weren't for these bridges right above us, these old bridges, we wouldn't have, the city wouldn't have grown because the city grew due to its great water supply that it had. Prevents a lot of spread of disease and such. Hey Jordan, anonymous vibes. It is uh, Titanic vibes, yes, indeed. Uh, I'm the king of the world. <laughs> so 
So here we're seeing all the interconnection between the Bronx and Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, we're passing, we passed the area of the cloisters. Spartan Dival uh, Swing Bridge yet? Did I miss it? Says, I think we might have passed it. I'm not 100% sure. We're also seeing, at least in this area, there are remnants of old uh, mansions that used to be located right here at the waterfront. Wow, this is magnificent. Jamie says how long the tour is, about three hours. <laughs> Magnus says I'm stuck, yeah, I'm in these stuck. sailboat theme is a consolidated Edison or Kaya Edison substation. 
time Edison covered up some of its transmission equipment because they were supposed to build okay, everyone, a new I have to go to the restroom. I'm going to leave the camera right so you can see the views. Hope you enjoy it. I'll be back. Creek neighborhood, but New York City never allocated any money for that purpose. left-hand side just ahead of us, you'll see another example of a flood wall that was constructed after Superstorm Sandy. This is the 207th Street Railroad Yard, and you'll notice it's gray in color, made of a series of interconnected silo-like structures, and these are essentially steel pilings hollow inside that protect this overhaul and repair shop for New York City subways to which we can get a brief glance. So when that storm surge came all the way up to this northern tip of the island, it inundated, flooding this repair shop, and it took quite a while to make repairs. And of course, they want to make sure that we don't have a repeat of the flooding and the damage the next time we are struck by a hurricane in New York City. We are coming up to the northern tip of the island of Manhattan, and we're soon going to bear left. And once we bear left, we are going to be entering the Harlem River Ship Canal. The Harlem River Ship Canal, which was carved out by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the mid-1890s to create a wider, deeper passage for larger boats so that we can connect from the Harlem River to the Hudson River. Before the construction of the ship canal, Manhattan was definitely an island, but it was only the smallest flat bottom boats that were able to make that connection.
it's hard to imagine how much the shoreline and the waterways have been transformed at this northern tip as part of the creation of this ship canal. The Harlem River used to go about seven blocks further to the north. So instead of curving, we would have just continued north, rafting around the northern tip of the island. At the northernmost point, would be, which would be off to our right, it connected to the Spite and Dival Creek, a narrow, shallow body of water that made an S shape and as it made its way to the Hudson River. So we just made it under the Broadway Bridge during high tide, and we are heading toward the Hudson River. So if we look to our right, you'll notice the Marble Hill train station for Metro North trains. Marble Hill is about eight square blocks. They used to be physically connected to Manhattan. It was severed when they built this canal. It was a mini island unto itself. Landfill was at in 1914, connecting Marble Hill to the Bronx. So it's Marble Hill is physically connected to the Bronx, but as a political entity, Marble Hill is part of Manhattan, which is New York County. So since the Bronx is the only borough of New York City on the mainland of the United States, it means there's a super small sliver of Manhattan on the And then if you look up on our left, you can see the large stadium lights for Columbia University. Their football field, this is where their Lions play and lose their home games. Oh, but they play their home games here. And in the 1920s, Columbia University purchased a large expanse of land in this Inwood neighborhood for their various sports and recreational offerings. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I just had to go. I really had to go. Uh, usually I could hold it in, but no. And indeed, there's two bathrooms, and they're very clean and very nice and very ample. So it's great. I do recommend uh, it. There's a good toilet here. All right, let me show you more. Swing Bridge. It's a great view. The Spike and Dival Swing Bridge is in its open position. It is the only bridge that has to open up for us because, as we'll see, the Spike and Dival Bridge has a very low clearance. That is the only bridge where there's a bridge operator located there all the time. If there are any Amtrak trains crossing, DSS, they have to wait. Oh, yes. If those Amtrak trains are not coming, they swing the bridge open for us, and we go back to the Hudson River, where today we have an absolutely spectacular view in the background of the New Jersey Palisades. And as we can see, the leaves are changing color to those orange, brown, and yellow colors. Everyone, let me know in the comments what Spite and Devil translates in Dutch. I think it translates to Spitting Devil. <laughs> and this is a very, one, the lowest lying bridge in New York City. Look at that. It's a swing bridge. Wow, right there, George Washington Bridge, there in the distance. Beautiful green waters, okay, beautiful so palisades. We are now in the northernmost. This is north, that's south. We're on the Hudson River, folks. Right there, does anybody know what bridge that is? It's one of the newest bridges in New York State. It's the new Mario Promo Bridge. 
It's getting rocky. Exactly. We got some Rockland County folks mm -hmm. back there. <laughs> so, I'm there. All right, great. This is this is considered one of the most beautiful views in the world. And when Europeans came, they thought they were in Europe. It is absolutely gorgeous. On the we are facing New Jersey. It's New Jersey on the right side of the starboard side of the boat. That view is not there by accident. So if you can imagine what development is like wow. here in our region and all of the buildings we see down there on the sides, up farther. Thank you so much. This has Thank no you. visible buildings except for one the small table. location okay. up here, which Thank is a, a, a Palisades Park Commission office. Wow. The Rockefeller family worked years and years to purchase land and, and eventually all of the communities and townships behind Palisades passed laws that prevented large buildings from being built to, that would ruin the view. And I was involved in a number of uh, people in different uh, environmental organizations and urban planning organizations bought a tower that was going to be proposed to be built um, in one of the cities, and I'm forgetting the name exactly of the city, but it was an LG tower, um, high rise, and the mayor had changed the regulations to allow it because it was a good development decision for the city. And over several years, there was a coalition built to fight that, and LG increased the height. Now we can't see it. It was built, and we can't see the LG Tower, and that maintains this beautiful view. I don't know if anybody has hiked or walked through this part of the Pal this is one of the Palisades parks. It's absolutely gorgeous, so I highly recommend it. And the further down you go, you can walk underneath the George oh, Washington pass. Bridge. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm good here. Yeah. views of New York City, and especially at night, I cannot recommend it enough. It's <laughs> absolutely fabulous. Um, and I believe this is Ross Dock, if I'm not mistaken. It's one of the locations you can get to from the Palisades Parkway on the New Jersey side as well. Um, and, and also, just to, one of the things is that if you think about all of what we just saw on the other side of, of Manhattan, you know, when, um, when, the, when Native Americans lived here before the Europeans came, this is pretty much what it looked like in terms of lots of trees. This was a forested, extremely uh, ecologically rich place, and um, it had a lot to offer, which is one of the reasons why it was settled by Europeans first, and one of the first places in the country. And so it gives you a taste of the way this was um, back um, 400 years ago. So the beautiful Palisades right in front of us. Great cliff sides, in my opinion, great natural beauty right within the metropolitan area of New York City. It's immensely beautiful, especially during fall. Talking about this wonderful landscape we have on our left hand side with hills and valleys. A wonderful exhibit in 2009-2010 called Manhattan, a project of Eric Sanderson, a conservation ecologist, and he recreated the landscape and the topography of the island of Manhattan when, back in 1609 when the navigator, the British navigator Henry Hudson sailed up the namesake river with all these hills and valleys. And the not in their own language called this island Manhattan, island of many hills. And we're across from a valley right now. This is Dykeman Street, about 204th Street. As we go to the next hill, you'll notice a square-shaped tower rising up. It has arch Romanesque window openings and a red tile rooftop. This is the Cloisters, the whole complex is the Cloisters, one of the many Rockefeller family initiatives here in New York City. And I talk about the Rockefellers when you're having a climate change tour. It was John D. Rockefeller who founded Standard Oil, made a fortune for oil refinery distribution and sales. And they have had a huge impact on the built environment, Rockefeller Center, spearheading both Battery Park City and the World Trade Center, donating land to the United Nations so the UN would be here in Manhattan. And the Cloisters Project, but recent generations of Rockefellers have de 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 disinvested from fossil fuels from their Rockefeller Brothers Fund, billions of dollars. They played a huge role in preserving landscape.
landscapes and advocating for climate change. So recent Rockefeller generations really deserve credit in terms of the efforts they've made on the climate change front. So the Cloisters on our left was a project of John D. Rockefeller Jr., the son. He purchased a collection of artifacts from monastic sites, both from sites in France and Spain, donated them to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the cloisters, part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, is where they house their medieval art and architecture collection. And the cloisters, as it's designed by the architect Charles Collins, integrates elements of both romantic, Romanesque sites and Gothic sites. The Rockefellers also donated the land on top of this hill, which is now Fort Tryon Park, a public New York City park. Many times I've taken the A subway up to 190th Street at the southern foot of the park, so I went walk through the wonderful Fort Tryon Park, and then at the northern end, visit the Cloisters, plus the Rockefellers played a role in the preservation of the New Jersey Palisades by 700 acres part of that ongoing effort to preserve this wonderful, largely untouched landscape on the New Jersey side. So here on board, they have uh, a few food options. Uh, they have the various plates. I misunderstood at first. I thought they said food plate, but this is a fruit plate. Um, I'm a little bit allergic to some of these fruits, so I'm not gonna eat them. Uh, but they also have a shrimp plate. And I'm so excited to try this out. Let's try it out and I'll show you more views. So let's try this out. Yeah, let me look at my notes. I'm so excited. It's too bad, I was gonna say Shrimp. I'm not sure where they're from, but I'll, I'll choose to believe that they're freshly caught from the water over here. <laughs> or the Long Island South, which will be a little bit better. Mm. 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 Really good, really juicy. That's amazing. There's nothing better than eating shrimps on a 1920s style yacht, circumnavigating around the island of Manhattan. And right behind me, beautiful autumn views of the trees changing color. Mm, this is the life. It's basically Great Gatsby, Alan, 2022. The sauce is a bit spicy. That's great. Oh, wow. So I hope you're enjoying this tour. I definitely am. It's gorgeous views right now. And I think this area of Upper Manhattan is underutilized. I'm doing very well. Uh, this area of Upper Manhattan is underutilized, I think. A lot of people don't know it, especially if you're traveling to New York City. Even New Yorkers don't know the immense natural beauty that's right behind us here in this area of uh, Fort Tyron Park, and then right in front of us, we have the New Jersey Palisades. Truly. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. It is amazing, yeah. Truly one of the best days we can visit, especially now that the leaves are changing. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I'm so curious why this is not more famous, because a lot... Palisades. Yeah, Palisades. More, more tourists don't know about it. Story. Yeah. I don't know. Some people... Yeah. There's, a, there's a real Manhattan-centric sense to everything, I think, yeah, in so I think many so. ways. Tourists think of New York as Manhattan. Manhattanites think of Manhattan as New York, <laughs> and only New York, right? Right. And, and 
you know, it's not super easy to get here without a car. That's one of the things. Uh, that's the other thing, yeah. And I think, honestly, that's probably a big part of it. Right. It's an incredible so we are history of the Revolutionary War. Oh, on the Hudson River, it starts way down, and there's, there's Revolutionary War sites in the park. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Oh, so you think it's also worth actually going to the this side? Yeah. yeah. Not just seeing it from the Manhattan oh, side. I mean, it's so great. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's just the views are incredible. Right. The is amazing. The little parts along the way. There's a Chinatown in Fort Lee. There's some incredible food. Oh. And yeah, it's, it's, it's all small. I mean, yeah. relative to the size of the U.S. of Manhattan, it's tiny. But right. But still, like, it's... Like, That's fascinating. Okay, yeah. I, I might actually do a video myself over there now. Yeah. Yeah. I never even considered going to this area of New Jersey, aside from seeing it from a cruise, like where we are today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro are the architects of the High Line. They went on to do many other parks in New York City. And um, it's amazing that they're also involved in this medical school, too. And now we're starting to see the views again of downtown and midtown as well. Look at that. Due to the ge geography, it, the views are just impeccable because uh, Manhattan kind of uh, bends a little bit. So you truly see the full scope of the city here. We have Washington Heights. One of the things I love about the Washington Heights neighborhood is they now have 100 large scale murals painted on the sides of buildings. It's a surprising sight. These murals depict over 130 bird species that are under threat as a result of climate change. It's a project of the Audubon Society, and it's the Audubon Society that is named after John James Audubon, the famous ornithologist who painted those wonderful life-size 
renderings of the birds of North America. And in New York City, surprisingly, we've recently passed legislation so that we don't kill so many migrating birds. You can imagine in a city like New York City where we have built many, many hundreds of glass-clad office and residential buildings, those are prime targets for birds. Birds are often attracted to the lower floors of these glass-clad buildings where the glass reflects the trees and the flowers and shrubs. Birds don't realize they're not heading toward the real thing. They crash into the glass and die. And so new legislation will require build, new buildings or buildings that are retrofitting to have glass sheets that embed geometric shapes that the birds will see and that will sharply reduce the number of birds that are killed. And you'll notice on our left, there's two blocks with ample tree covering and no residential buildings. Ooh. That is Trinity Cemetery and Mausoleum. A number of famous New Yorkers are buried there, including John James Audubon, the ornithologist I mentioned. Just to the left, is a wide cross street coming to you now. That is West 155th Street. And in 1811, New York City started to build out its street grid. It has 155 cross streets. And does anybody know the name of Street Zero? There is no name Street Zero. Yes, it is Houston Street, just south of Greenwich Village. So that street grid, a rectilinear grid with the north-south avenues and the east-west cross streets went from Houston Street up to here to 155th Street. Much of the island south of here, really more so south of 96th Street, was leveled. Hills were torn down and valleys filled in have more or less a flat surface for implementing that street grid. And since this, that street grid did not go further north, by the time we built the roads at the north of the Slender Neck, we didn't bother messing with the contours that topography we saw before with the many hills and valleys. So that's the original topography, what we have here in front of us, and further south is the much transformed landscape. The waterways that we've traveled today are so much cleaner than they used to be. When I was a kid in the 1960s and 70s here in New York City, we never thought about the waterways. I barely knew I lived on an island because these waterways were filthy. There was contamination from industrial plants in the Hudson River Valley to the north that floated south, and we did have sewage treatment plants whatsoever. So to the, back then you would have not had the swimming component of the New York City Triathlon taking place right here on the Hudson River as it is today. And Courtney will share more about the sewage treatment plants and other structures we have today. So here on the on the left, those arched uh, that arch structure is actually a wastewater treatment plant and it has a park on top. The park consists also of a swimming pool and an entire complex. And this wastewater treatment plant was built um, in the 1980s. And uh, they were, it pretty much spawned the environmental justice movement of New York City. And the reason why is that this was, this is still for the most part um, a, a lower income and mostly people of color community in New York and it was and one of the issues was one of the fundamental uh, made, the fundamental definition of environmental justice is that we have built the most polluting and the most dangerous infrastructure in communities that have the least political power and this is an ex example of that however um, the, the park is the park was built on top of it, including all the facilities, in order to make amends and provide some community benefit to this part of, of New York City, Morningside Heights. And so, and it's an example of both progress, but also a symbol of how the, the past decisions really have affected the way that people have, have been able to survive and live, and the different, and the disparities there are in health 
uh, among Americans. Um, and then the last thing I want to say though about uh, about wastewater is that the reason why you can actually swim in this water, believe it or not, you can, um, is that the Clean Water Act has been so strong and has provided so much funding for over the last 50, 60 years to clean up the sewage that was going into the waterways untreated for a long, long time. And so wastewater treatment plants like this are modernized now and account for the majority of the water quality improvements. I will say the one thing about climate change and wastewater treatment. Wastewater treatment plants, and I believe some of what you can't see in this facility, are built mostly at water level. That's because the water is pumped in, the sewage is pumped in, it's treated and it's held in holding tanks so that the bacteria can slowly eat away at the, at the waste. That sea level rise, or that sea level, those sea level uh, holding tanks are incredibly threatened by storm surges. And so there's uh, close to $350 million is being invested by New York City to create walls to prevent storm surges from going into the wastewater treatment plants and taking them offline. And one other really important part of that is making sure that all of the electrical equipment, the pumping equipment, the technology that makes it possible for the bacteria to break down the waste and for the water to be enter, entering our waterways more clean, that technology has to also be moved and retrofitted so that storms won't destroy and take these wastewater treatment plants offline. There's a hundred billion, uh, sorry, there's one billion dollars of new assets in wastewater treatment and so this is a critical investment that New York City has been making significant progress on. Um, and one thing, if you've ever driven, just to note, if you've ever driven on the West Side Highway with your windows open, you have smelled this plant before. So it, <laughs> it's not like the park solved the problems entirely. There's still smell. There are still ships that have to come in and take the smell. There's an entire shipping component of the New York City Department of Environmental Protection moving the sludge out of the wastewater treatment plants that is eventually going to landfills because they take the solids out of the wastewater. Mm. So I'll just say one last thing about, about water quality, um, and then I'll hand it back over to Doug, but has anybody seen that um, there are whales now? The people are, are seeing uh, uh, whale watching trips in, in the harbor, there are seals, there's increased light of fish life, etc. all because of decreased pollution in, in our waterways. So it's it's one of those amazing ironies that we're facing some incredible threats from climate change, but at the same time, the investments and the changes that we made 40, 50, 60 years ago are really starting to pay off. I think that's a symbol of where we can come to climate change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, so right now, this should be the spire one of the taller churches in New York City. And if I'm correct, yeah, that is Riverside Church right here, right by General Grant's tomb. It's the only U.S. president to be entombed in New York City. Uh, general U President Ulysses S. Grant was also General Ulysses S. Grant who helped us win the Civil War. But this is one of the tallest church towers in the world. Uh, has a massive amount of Carolyn Bells as well. You can see the large bell tower of the neo Gothic style of Riverside Church and another Rockefeller family initiative that preceded the cloisters we saw. Just to the left, there's a smaller neoclassical work as Ionic Tom wrapping around that cylindrical structure with a conical rooftop. That is Grant's tomb, formerly the mausoleum for Ulysses S. Grant. Grant was the lead general for the Union side, the Northern side, for the end of the American Civil War. And then he was elected twice as President of the United States. When I was a kid, the riddle was, I grew up in this neighborhood, just to the south, who is buried in Grant's tomb? and I never understood the correct answer when I was a kid. The correct technical answer is nobody's buried in Grant's tomb because both Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia Dent Grant, are in side-by-side -side sarcophagi at the lowest level of mausoleum. 
effectively in two, but not very. In the end, you can use whatever vocabulary you would like to. <laughs> I'm not sure if you heard it, but the age old riddle is who's buried at Grant's tomb? And the trick que it's a trick question because no one is. General Grant so is in tomb, City, in this tomb. We have three reservoirs, which means he's above ground. All in upstate New York that provide us with one billion gallons of water per day. And much of that water, the potable water, comes into the city through the power of gravity and automatically up to the sixth floor of the building. If the building is taller, you usually have an electric water pump in the basement that pumps that water up to the roof level. And if you look at the top of many of these residential buildings closest to us, you can see the wooded water towers where this potable of fresh water is stored. And so when you turn on your cold water faucet, you're pulling down that fresh water, and then there's usually a hot water heater in the basement that heats up that water to its own pipes, delivers the fresh water to each residential unit. The residential buildings closest to us are built along Riverside Drive, the tree-lined curving boulevard with many monumental works. Three war buildings. I'm going to make another request not to be obnoxious, but some folks can't hear and we really appreciate your help. Sorry again, but thank you so much for being gracious. That these are pre-war buildings built before World War II, even though some technically before World War I. And the reason for the strong uniformity and design along Riverside Drive is because many were built in the 1910s and 20s same roof height, building materials, and design elements. And when these buildings were constructed, nobody was thinking about energy efficiency. They had their boilers in the basement, heating water, turning it into steam. The steam then went up to the clunky, noisy radiators. And there was so much heat, sometimes there is so much heat, I live in the upper west side here, that you have to open up your windows because it's just too hot. And actually, by opening your windows, it does help prevent diseases from spreading to a certain extent. Those were of greater concern than our concerns today. And we are concerned now about energy efficiency. And some of these buildings are going to have to undergo significant retrofits over the years to come, because New York City has passed new climate legislation called the Climate Mobilization Act of 2019 that requires, starting in 2024, that's just two years, for buildings to start reducing their use of energy, but more importantly, reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that are pumped into the atmosphere, atmosphere that contribute to the warming of our planet. So we have ambitious plans underway. And that 1970, oh, that 20, 17 climate legislation act, in part the main source of greenhouse gases in New York City, which is buildings. 70% of our greenhouse gases come from emissions from buildings. And so the buildings that will have to start reducing their use or their emissions of greenhouse gases include 50,000 build, 50, buildings in New York City, that is all buildings that have more than 25,000 square feet, which include all these pre-war buildings that we are looking at right now. About 20% of these residential buildings will be impacted by this legislation in two years. These are the buildings that have the lowest energy efficiency ratings. But starting in 2030, much larger percentage of buildings will have to take a number of steps such as retrofits. The retrofit I mentioned before, the Empire State Building changed its windows so it may be more energy efficient. It could be rebuilding the envelope, the facade of the building, in order to ensure in the winter, for example, that you don't have cold air entering 
your parking unit, and they were going to have to make transition from boilers in many cases that generate steam heat from radiators to what I mentioned before are called heat pumps. Heat pumps used to be only used in the south of the United States where the temperature never went below 40 degrees. Now, heat pumps are much more effective even in colder weather climates like here in the northeast of the United States. So what a heat pump does is in the winter, what a heat pump can do is extract warm air from the cold air outside. It sounds like an odd concept, but it can actually extract the hot air from outside and push it into your residence. Heat pumps are based on electricity and are much more energy efficient. But in the summer, they do the reverse. They can actually take heat inside your residential unit and push it outside. So a heat pump actually is a heat displacement system. It's just moving heat from one location to another. So you warm or cooler temperatures, which is why these heat air conditioners and heaters, since they operate as heat displacement units. And I mentioned they operate on electricity. So as long as New York State and city do their part by significantly increasing our renewable sources of electricity, then we will be in much better shape in New York City as we try to make this important transition to eventually generating zero greenhouse gases by 2050. Mm. So let me show you where we're at right now. We have a view of Manhattan. And we started around Chelsea, right here. This is the classic harbor line, Pier 62. Uh, that's where we boarded the yacht. We took it all the way down, all the way down. We're going all the way. We went all the way around. We passed around the island, Ward Island, the Bronx, all the way up through Spite and Dival Bridge, Inwood Park, etc., all the way down Riverside Park, which we're just passing right now. And we're going to start passing adjacent to Central Park, perpendicular or parallel to uh, Central Park, right here. They're filming for a TV station, uh, Classic Harbor Lines, if you could let us know who they're filming for. Where, can people see the produced version or the broadcasted version of this? So yeah, they're filming. If we look south in the direction we are heading towards Midtown, we can see that new generation of super tall towers that have completely transformed the skyline of Midtown. These are also known as billionaire road towers for the obvious reason it tends to be the super wealthy from around the world that invest their money, park their money, launder their money in these very expensive condominiums. Nobody likes to go. And the most expensive unit so far has sold for $238 billion, a triplex at the top of one of these towers. These towers did not exist when we started these tours just over a decade ago, so we can see how recent that transformation has actually been. If you look at the funny air road tower farthest from us, it is that white square shadow, white square shaped tower now back then with a flat rooftop, 432 Park mm. Avenue, Park What's Avenue, you and 57th Street. These towers are on that 57th Street Carter. That is by Uruguay Board architect Raphael Vignoli. If you start at the rooftop and then go down 11 floors, you can see those two floors that allow you to see the sky on the other side. Those are pass-through galleries that allow the wind to pass through, minimizing the sway. And these towers do sway a bit, even though on the rooftop or on the top floor, you have to put two mass dampers usually massive blocks of concrete that act like a shock absorber as the building sways in one direction that pulls it back to its point of equilibrium. And then if we look, my timing is just off. And so I was going to say, if we look to the next tower closer to us, but I'm going to pause a few seconds 
and wait for this super slender tower to come back into view. The tower I'm going to point out is the Steinway Tower, or 111 oh, wow. West 57th Street. Steinway Tower, because of the entranceways that start Steinway and Sun Piano Shoulder. And so now you'll notice coming to view a very slender tower on the right side as a series of gentle setbacks, a very narrow crown. This is one of the most slender skyscrapers in the world. This one and right in the center screen. A slenderness ratio of 24 to 1, meaning the height of the tower is 24 times the width at the base of that tower. And that is by Shop Architects, another important New York City based architectural firm. They designed the Barclays Center for Virginia Sports Events for musical performances in Brooklyn there. Tickets, thank you, Classic Harbor Line. Tickets for this tour range between $86 and $106. 100% worth it, especially if you're a lover of architecture. In this case, also, they're talking about sustainability and the New York City waterfront. And also, it's a very comfy ride. It's a great way to see New York City in style. I do recommend it. And um, this is indeed sponsored by Classic Harbor Line. So, round the parts to Classic Harbor Line for sponsoring this broadcast for inviting me over here thank you thank you so much check them out classic harbor line on instagram we still have a little bit left on the tour just a little bit because we're nearing uh chelsea where we embarked uh stay tuned on saturday if you missed anything on this tour i'll be back live on their instagram classic harbor line on instagram add them on instagram and i'll be live on there as well taking over their instagram about change Stick around, things. I'll answer questions uh, once I, once the tour finishes. Involved. At some level, um, the most important thing is supporting and lending your voice to efforts to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, wherever that might be. There are all kinds of ways to do that. There are many organizations working on that, including us, but one, one small button. Casa Corbin, if you can answer this question, I'll be so appreciative. Is the boat accessible to us. People think that they, they can't tell, like, oh, it wouldn't it matter, I got this email, did I click on it or not, it doesn't matter, who cares. It actually really works. Lots of groups, including us, will send the names of people who care to the decision makers. There's a number of numbers, so I just can't encourage you to do that enough. When it comes to preparing your community, your neighborhood, your home, for the effects of climate change, make sure that you are knowledgeable, you get resources from your local organizations, plan for change. And also, last message, everybody should have flood insurance. Even if you don't think you live in a flood zone, it's a great idea. If you don't live in a flood zone, it's a lot less expensive and you never know what might happen. So that's one of our biggest message, messages across the board. Okay, it's been great being here with all of you today. If you have any, yes, if you have any questions for me or you want to get involved with the Waterfront Alliance or support us, please just let me know and I can give you my card before we go. That was amazing. <laughs> so that was Courtney and Doug Fox. Uh, Courtney, where can people find more of the work that you're doing? Uh, yeah, yeah, we would love to know. And do let us know your last name once again. Sure. Yeah. Should I look at the camera? Or yeah. You? Oh, you're at me. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm Courtney Quarrel. I'm the mm. president of the Waterfront Alliance. Mm. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. So, what else should I say? <laughs> uh, how can people find more information about the Waterfront Alliance and um, yeah. and how to help out if they want to or learn a way that they can contribute? Yeah. yeah so, uh, Waterfront Alliance uh, is working, in fact, across the nation now on all things having to do with climate resilience and improving and protecting waterfronts and coastlines. To get involved, go to our website, waterfrontalliance.org. Mm. You, you can participate in our events. We have an amazing conference every year that brings together hundreds and hundreds of people to talk about a whole wide variety of issues. And um, you and you can also get involved with volunteer events that some of our partner organizations put on, beach cleanups, 
things like that. If you're, in, if you're an educator yeah. or a teacher, we have an amazing climate curriculum for middle school and high school students, including labs you can do on the waterfronts and coastlines, and so just there's abundance of resources. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Thank you again for the tour. That was amazing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, likewise. Yeah. Yeah. Round the parts to Courtney, everyone. Waterfront Alliance. Around the world, this is actually a rental building, and that wide expanse is facing due west, so it captures ample sunlight in the afternoon that filters down to the courtyard through that irregular cutout in the middle. 10, 15 years ago or so, it would have been dumped down to think there would be high end residential offerings right along the shoreline of this west side. As a marker, if you look at Pier 94 on our left, you go inland past the trees, you come to a lightly green-tinted, glass-clad, sculptural-like work that features a series of rooftop gardens that step down a serpentine-like pattern. This is the Mercedes house, named after the Mercedes car dealership on the ground floor by the Mexican architect Enrique Norton. And this is a residential offering. We have a great view of Midtown Manhattan and Skyline on its left side, a different vantage point. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that right. new generation of millionaire road towers. And then if we look to the right side of Midtown, we have a collection of mostly office buildings centered in the Times Square, 42nd Street, that is the theater district as well. That was revived starting in the 1990s when Disney came to town and took over the historic New Amsterdam Theater. Nice seeing cruise ships stop once again at the Manhattan Cruise ship terminals during much of the pandemic, there were zero cruise ships. Now, all three of our main ports in New York City, New Jersey, frequently see cruise ships that are docked here. And this great old aircraft carrier is Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate that. Five euro super chat. Thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Everyone, I hope you're enjoying the tour. If you have any questions for Doug Fox, uh, who's the architecture slash history tour guide, uh, I'll do my best to ask him. So ask now, I'll do my best to ask him if he's uh, available uh, right after he finishes up uh, wrapping up the tour. I love seeing urban farms and green rooftops in New York City. And on our immediate left, right along the shoreline, there's a multi lot, low built structure, which is the Javits Convention Center, initially opening in the late 1980s, but expanded since then. And on its leftmost side, its northern side, directly across from us, on the rooftop, you can see that jagged gray stainless steel rooftop. That portion of the Javits rooftop has an urban farm. They even have hydroponics offerings in the enclosed atrium. Hydroponics is growing vegetables, herbs in water and adding nutrients to it. And so it's completely grown year round. And you'll notice as we get to the center portion of Javits, it has a glass filing with step down on either side. This glass was recently replaced as part of an overhaul, and these glass units have frits or dots, geometric shapes carved into the glass. An example of what I was talking about before, 
when creating bird-friendly glazing of glass units, so you significantly reduce the number of birds flying into this Japanese convention center. And we're arriving at one of the negative elements. This is the Hudson Yards development that consists of these large soaring glass clad towers. The largest private real estate development in the history of New York City, about a $25 billion undertaking. Right along the shoreline, where you see the trees, you can get intermittent views of the brown rusted sides of the high line, the elevated high line. Do my best, thank you, Sharon. Opened in 2009, and as the high line rising up from the street level of the parks of the Hudson Yard, you can see that brown copper colored steel structure here, which looks like a honeycomb shape. That is the vessel, the yard installation at Hudson Yards, designed by Thomas Heatherwick, the British designer who designed Barry Dillon and undulated here. We saw the impact of this very early on. One of my favorite offerings at Hudson Yard is just out of view. <laughs> I see the building. I have to interrupt. <laughs> it was perfectly in frame. That's cool. Fun opportunity. So, and part of the building is perfectly in frame in between the Hudson Yards building. The outer shell can actually open up and close like a telescope, so you can quickly reconfigure the size of that space. Yes, the shed is in Hudson Yards, and it's another design by Diller, Scopidio, and Renko, who also designed, designed the highlight that we just saw. And we're going to be docking soon, so Captain Justin requested everybody grab a seat inside the cabin, and Captain Justin will let everybody know once the lines are tied, that it is safe to stand up and disembark. And as everybody's beginning to grab a seat, I will point out our last architectural treasure for the day. You'll notice there's a point of reference along the shoreline. There's a low slung building. It's mostly black. It has a red horizontal stripe running through it and postal trucks on the rooftop to the right of that. And there's a taller 19-story freestanding residential building. It has four vertical bays of windows with black trim divided by those silvery curving columns. That is the ensuite Sky Garage building by the German-born American architect Annabelle Seldorf. Annabelle Seldorf is known for some wonderful galleries including here in this West Chelsea neighborhood. If you want one of those expensive duplexes, you can drive your Tesla, vehicle, you can drive your car into the elevator on the ground floor, bring your car and yourself up to the floor where you have the entrance to your duplex, park your car, walk a couple of feet, you are in your $20 million plus car home right in the heart of West Chelsea where we are going to dock in just a moment. Wow. Joshua asks, are we on the AIM? On the AIA New York Architecture and Climate Change Report on this wonderful, stunning day, I'd like to start and especially thank Courtney for joining me, co narrating the sport today. Thank you so much, Courtney. And Captain Justin and the crew, Matt and Sarah and Jacob, do a wonderful job looking out for our safety and serving us drinks and food, so why don't we give them a hand as well. Thank you so much. By the way, are there any architects, landscape architects, or others who might benefit from continuing education units? Over here and over there. Okay, I'll bring the floor to you so you can actually sip champagne and get continuing education units during these trips. And once we dock in a few moments, just a reminder, please stay seated and care until Captain Justin says it's safe to get up. Uh, I will be the first person to exit the boat. I'll be on top of the pier, happy to answer any questions you may have 
And as you exit the boat, there'll be a tip jar where you can show your appreciation to the captain and crew. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I did, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a lot of great stuff, yeah, especially with the full foliage and everything. Yeah. You can, I can imagine you, you know, you can yeah. go into like a thousand different places for even more information. It's just there's so many things. Right. There's so much. There's so much. It's great to know, especially about the industrial buildings, the new ones, like the, he just mentioned the Tesla one. I mean, the charging station area. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that that stuff is not usually talked about, at least not publicly, not like for tourism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know much about you. How many followers do you have? Right now, I have a total of maybe 850,000 across a few platforms. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've covered cities all around uh, Europe and North America. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a car? I don't have a car, but you can find me on Urbanist Exploring Cities. Okay. Urbanist Exploring Cities. Yeah. And that's my main YouTube channel. Yeah, I realized realize that, that it is necessary. <laughs> no, but a lot of people do ask for it. <laughs> I know. No, it is, it's a lot easier to give someone a card than uh, tell them the name. Isn't that funny? Yeah. There, unsubscribe. Are you guys also involved with the Newtown Creek, or have you have any yeah. oversight in that, or like you guys uh, are involved with that? Oh, I would love that. Can you write down your email? Yeah. yeah. Did oh, I give you my card? Oh, or card. Yeah, that would work. What's that? Or card would work. Yeah. Okay. I'll just write it down. Uh, because I um, might have be able to give you his too. I've been so uh, fascinated with that specific creek because it's beautiful, but also it's, it's very disgusting. it's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> it's so disgusting. Right. I've been on the internet. Yeah, like it's like why would anybody care? Like. <laughs> But, but of course they do, and I yeah, do too. Like right. because it's because of where it's located. See, and the history of it is amazing. It is, yeah. I think it has so much potential because uh, my light bulbs turned on when I saw the Chicago River, and that used to be very industrial, very gritty. People didn't even like going on the waterfront until the late '90s, and I thought to myself, "But well, why not Newton Creek as well? We can have so much potential for development." Write it down because I'm still alive and I don't want to <laughs> say anyone's uh, number out loud. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. going to take a sec here. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. So I did. I've run out of uh, memory on my phone and so every app unloads and has to be Oh, yeah, no worries. Stay tuned, I'll show you the outside of the ship in a bit. For now, enjoy the views of the ship inside. Thank you. 
Here's the, the ship. I'll show it to you one more time uh, before I disembark. So right here, we have, this is the back sign. It was very full. There was a big party here. So I couldn't really walk back during the tour, but it's cool because you get to see views. In the tours, you get to uh, book a table. And uh, for example, this particular cruise was a quiet cruise. So that's why they encourage people to keep was, a lower how level. How was the live it was wonderful, yeah. yeah. People loved it, yeah. Great, like how many viewers did you have? I think we might have had a little bit more than a thousand people tune in overall, yeah. Cool, will it be somewhere that we can like look at it? Yes, uh, yeah. Urbanist Exploring Cities on YouTube. Urbanist Exploring Cities. Yeah, Okay. there we go, yeah. Thank you Thanks. again for inviting yeah. me. Jones asks, is it wheelchair accessible? Not really, but they do accommodate if anyone has mobility issues the best they can. Um, those are the bathrooms down there. They have the kitchen down there. And uh, one more time, the outer deck of the ship. That was amazing. So they're filming for a German TV station. And let me, yeah, watch your step. So this is the Manhattan 2, 100 foot long yacht, 1920s inspired, really cool design. Magical Simpson says, wow, the quality of the video is excellent. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Doug, yeah. one more time. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I hope you got good stuff. Well, we it definitely did. It seemed like did. you had great. When you were doing your selfies, it looked like you had spectacular light 
in the background? It definitely, yeah. I felt like I was in the Great Gatsby. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where, where can people find more of your tours? Um, you can, I don't know, I was trying to think, why am I going like that? I'm trying to think, do I have any cards? I have zero cards. And my website is eons behind. But okay, okay. You my, are you coming back Saturday? Uh, yes, I'm coming okay. back Saturday. We yeah. can exchange okay, contacts perfect. and... Uh, and you do tours for the AIA yeah, and uh, all the tours. time. And I your own tours. New York City, history, architecture, whatever. Oh, cool. Okay, what's the website so people and, know? Well, my yeah. website is yeah. in terrible shape. Yeah. It's, when I was doing World Trade Center, it yeah. has other tours, so it's World Trader Center Tour. Ah, I see. Com. But okay. I'll give that to you also. Perfect. Have a great day, Doug. Great. Yeah, bye-bye. So Doug Fox, search him up on Google. He has a few different tour websites. Um, he mentioned he has a World Trade Center tour and does tours for the American Institute of Architects. Here's uh, another yacht, Ooh, the Kingston. There's the, the Manhattan One uh, right over here. Look at that, gorgeous. And this is the check-in area at Chelsea Piers. Pier 62, and this is the check-in area. You can buy tickets over here. Ronald, uh, Ronald asked where they docked. We're at Pier 62, Chelsea Piers. It is right next to 23rd Street. The nearest train is the CE train on 23rd Street. You can also take the bus all along 23rd Street right to the corner and it's very convenient. Jordan says, good man, yes. Indeed, that was amazing. Oh, wow, I had a blast. Highly recommend coming here. Pro tip, there's a ca cafe right in front. There's public bathrooms here as well. Hudson Yards is with a walking distance. Uh, so there's quite a few things to do. You can also go to the High Line down there at 23rd Street. And, um, and the little island is a little bit further down. So let me see if I have any questions. Feel free to ask any questions that you had. Stick around for a few more minutes. Teacup says, that was amazing. You are amazing. Oh, I'm so glad. One more time, a round of hearts to Classic Harbor Lines. Thank you so much for inviting me over and for sponsoring this broadcast. Uh, it was my pleasure to show uh, all, many people all around the world the history of New York City architecture and its future with the waterfront and how it'll adjust to climate change. Uh, Jeff says, I enjoyed the tour a lot. I learned a lot. That's awesome. I'm glad you did. And um, Susie says, that was great. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Uh, that's awesome. I will be taking over the Classic Harbor Line Instagram on Saturday. It's going to be the same tour or very similar tour. Um, so if you want, if you missed anything, you can watch the replay, but if you want to see it again live, go to Classic Harbor Line on Instagram. Follow them on Instagram in general because they have a lot of cool short videos and things like that. And also uh, they announced their tours. Uh, Rafael says NFT photo prints. I am very tempted to offer NFT photo prints. Let me know if people are interested in that uh, because I am tempted. Kotsu says, awesome stream, Ariel and Classic Harbor. Yeah, are you ready to go on a lasting cruise, says Susie. Uh, <laughs> I think I am, uh, especially Alaska, that would be amazing. Uh, I've seen them advertised as Jones. Yes, and I do recommend them. I recommend them, if, especially if you want to go explore the waterfronts, the rivers, in style. Um, because if you go to a classic cruise, and there's many to choose from, there's a few, actually not many, but there's a few companies, um, they can be rather cramped with a lot of people on them and some cruise companies don't have the best speakers but here what I saw is that Harbor Cruise Line really had a great sound system as you can see as you can hear you heard the tour guide pretty fairly clearly uh, outside they had a sound system as well a little bit hard to capture with mics over here but in person I was able to hear the tour guide clearly outside as well that is very good. And the fact that it was so comfortable sit-in, great, great shrimp that I had, and they also had uh, drink options as well, including wine. I think that was a really cool bonus. 
The weather looks gorgeous. You're glowing, says Casey. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Casey. That's awesome to hear. Classic Harbor Line. I'll see you on Saturday again. And then tomorrow for another live stream, we'll be going around 12 p.m. I said 1 p.m. 1 p.m. 1 p.m. We are going north of New York to explore some cool haunted history. Lemon says, are you using at and Verizon? Verizon. Can you point where the South Street Seaport is from now? I can't teacup because I will have to point <laughs> through the island of Manhattan. Uh, but I'll know it's that general direction. The South Street Seaport's on the other side of Manhattan. Patrick says, perfect day. It really is. Let's all go for a coffee now. And then Negroni says, Susie, that sounds great. Thank you everyone so much for tuning in. I'll see you, uh, see you tomorrow, Friday at 1 p.m. Uh, for a tour of North of New York City. And then Saturday on Classic Harbor Line's Instagram. Classic Harbor Line. My mistake, I added a S a few times. Look, it's singular. Classic Harbor Line on Instagram. See you soon on Saturday at 1 p.m. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.